at this time, because we, I know we are on a time crunch, uh, I would like to introduce our City Council President, Dan Cahill, at this time, who will give a welcome from the city. Thank you. Leaders and political activists, it's always great to have you here in the city of Lynn. We welcome you all here. We welcome the candidates. Whoever should win in November, we expect you to be in Lynn uh, a lot. <laughs> On behalf of uh, Mayor Judith, Judith Flanagan Kennedy and my colleagues who are unable to be here this morning, we're actually running a mass municipal association meeting. Uh, down at City Hall with all the local officials from around the state. Very excited we haven't had one of those in the city of Lynn in a very long time. We'll be able to showcase some of the great assets we have here. But uh, on their behalf, on my behalf, I want to say good morning. Welcome to Lynn. I want to thank uh, the folks in this room for partnering with us in government uh, to make Lynn uh, a thriving community. We've addressed some serious issues. We look forward to addressing more issues with your help and uh, an unprecedented relationship and partnership has cultivated over the last several months and we look forward to, to, to uh, continuing that. I am joined by my colleague, uh, Councilor at Large, Hong Nett, who is here this morning. I hope you all enjoy your eggs and your sausage and your politics and I wish the candidates the best of luck in today. It's not an easy thing to do, but thank you again and again. Welcome to the City of Lynn. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dan. At this time, I'd like to introduce the Chairman of the Lynn Area Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors, Tasso Nicolakopoulos. Thank you, Leslie. Good morning, everyone. Welcome, candidates. Uh, I, I quickly want to point out uh, Council President uh, Dan Cagle and the City Council for being here today. Uh, their collaborative efforts and helping us to rezone downtown. I mean, they just, they looked at us and they asked the, the business community, what do we need in the downtown? And we collaboratively worked together with the business community and the city councils, and in a matter of a few minutes, the meetings, we had a brand, brand new rezone downtown. And uh, I'm glad you recognize the impediments that were really bogged down the downtown for a long time. Thank you for that. As you know, the recent zoning changes in our downtown includes a growing and energetic arts and cultural district, the expansion of North Shore Community University, the vastly growing Lynn Health Center, a jam-packed shows in our renovated auditorium, the opening of restaurants and the development of a coastline along the Lynnway. Yes, Boston Globe Magazine had it spot on. Lynn is one of the best communities to live in the North Shore. Although we have made great strides in our local on a local level to help bring in new development. The focus of this chamber along, all along has been about jobs. We need to get people to work. As an organization, we need to be a key partner in sustaining our local business and help members grow their businesses in the city. For the first time in over a quarter of a century, the sixth congressional district will have a new congressman. No matter who you choose on November 4th, the business community is asking for our federal government to please listen. According to the USA Today, small business in the most, is the most trusted institution in America. So why does our federal government choose to continue to pass policies and create barriers toward economic development? The country is slowly coming out of an eight-year recession, but yet Congress was determined to pass a health reform at the expense of our nation's chief job creators, and that's small businesses. The current U.S. healthcare system is skewed to favor large group insurance, and now smaller groups and individuals are paying more. As we all know in the business world, incentives and job creations aren't stimulated via higher taxes and increased mandates. But yet, the U.S. business tax rates are among the highest in the world. Key issues such as minimum wage, earned sick time, will have a dramatic effect in small businesses, and some will be forced to shut down. As we get closer to the winter, our region is facing an unprecedented spike in residential and commercial tax and commercial utility rates. Something has to give. All important issues and issues that need to be addressed. But let's look at it through the business sense approach. Thank you, and let's have a spirit of debate. Thank you, Tasso. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sean Leonard. I'm the editorial page editor of The Daily Item. 
Uh, thank you, Leslie, the entire chamber board. Uh, good morning, candidates. Uh, this is a tremendous honor for me, uh, especially given that this is the first debate in the general election between these two incredibly accomplished and uh, certainly worthy party nominees uh, for uh, uh, the 6th District uh, Congressional seat. Uh, I do have to complain uh, about one staff who this morning, right up front, on Sunday, I will be one of the judges of the Mrs. Essex County pageant at the Topsfield Fair. Thank you. Uh, this morning, in my haste, I actually grabbed the wrong set of prepared questions. So I thought it would be okay to play along with answering uh, this morning question about the big goods. I joke. I will be a judge, but I do have the right questions. And, uh, if we can quickly go over the format, uh, each of you will get two minutes for an opening. Uh, to each of the questions, I have about a dozen here. I want to try and work in some questions from the audience. Uh, you'll have two minutes to respond, and if you'd like to have time to rebut, uh, you have up to 45 seconds. Um, so with that, uh, we haven't decided the order, but why don't we just start with Mr. Tesse uh, for an opening. Thank you, and good morning, everybody. Um, let me just say first that uh, it's an amazing feeling to be standing here today on the eve of Columbus Day weekend, no less, knowing that when my great-grandfather came over from Italy and arrived here in Lynn, that there's no way that he ever could have imagined that one day his great-grandson would be standing here as a candidate for Congress for the United States. I've lived in this district all my life. In fact, I actually live on Main Street, and I actually work on Main Street. And I very much consider myself a part uh, and a product of the American dream first person in my family uh, to graduate from college. I spent my lifetime serving people, solving problems, and bringing people together. As a state senator, I was able to work with both Democrats and Republicans and deliver when it came to protecting seniors, working families, and most importantly, our most vulnerable. My oldest sister has been disabled all her life, so I know from personal experience just how important it is to have government programs and a strong social safety net. At the same time, I understand that we have limited resources, and spending needs to be prioritized, and the taxpayers' dollars must be spent with great care. As a small business owner, I understand how tough this economy is. I can't tell you the number of sleepless nights I've spent, lying in bed, staring at the ceiling, saying, how am I going to pay the bills, make the payroll, and keep the doors to the office <coughs> open? I understand the anxiety that people are feeling about the future. And I'll bring those concerns to Congress and work hard to get our country back on track. Now more than ever, our nation needs leaders who will solve problems, not just argue about them. We need leaders who will think independently and do what's best for the people. I have a track record of doing exactly that. I've never been afraid to cross the aisle and do what's right for Massachusetts because I've always known that no one party, Democrat or Republican, has a monopoly on good ideas. No one party is right all the time. And as your next congressman, I'll put the people of this district and our country first at all times. I know from experience that our leaders can work to, when our leaders work together, they can really do great things and they can accomplish quite a bit. So I'm asking for your vote on November 4th to help bring the change that we need uh, to Washington. And I would say, uh, just being here at the Lynn Chamber, um, this is obviously the largest city in the district and you will get all of my love. Thank you very much. I first just want to thank all of you for coming here. Uh, the supporters of both campaigns, the citizens of Lynn who want to take part in the democratic process, which is so important. And to everybody, happy Columbus Day weekend. I believe it's time for new leadership in Washington, to send new leaders to D.C. to break through the partisan gridlock and get things done for our country. And I've proven that I can get things done in some of the toughest environments on earth. The Tea Party Republicans are holding Washington hostage today, but they're not shooting at us yet. So we need to be able to rise up above the challenges that are gridlocking Washington, D.C. When I served in the Marines, I served with Marines from all over this country. Marines from Massachusetts and Vermont, from Alabama and Texas, from California and Utah. We came together with remarkably different backgrounds, different religious beliefs, different political beliefs, but at the end of the day, 
we were able to set aside those differences to do what's best for the country. And fundamentally, I think that's what Americans expect of Congress as well. We have 435 different representatives from across the country, each with their different constituents. But they ought to be able to come to Washington and find enough common ground to do what's best for all of us. And there is so much to be done. So much to be done for jobs and small businesses right here in the 6th District, including reforming the corporate tax code. So much to be done to ensure equal education opportunity at all, for all, universal pre-K, and ensuring that we take care of the college loan crisis. There's so much to be done for veterans and seniors to preserve Social Security and Medicaid, and to finally reform the VA. And it, as I work to do those things as your next congressman, I will never forget what it was like to live in the mud. I will never forget what it meant to have a platoon that was not all Democrats, or to start a small business that was not all Democrats. And I will never forget what it means to be a public servant, that at the end of the day, my work is to serve all of you, to serve this district, and to serve the United States of America. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I'll just uh, tell the candidates, Christine is our timekeeper over here, you'll be watching her, and if I can ask you to remain seated uh, during the response to, to the questions, and you'll be sharing the microphone. Uh, I'll pass. <laughs> First question, and uh, we'll uh, have Mr. Moulton answer this first. A recent study conducted jointly by Princeton and Northwestern Universities titled Testing Theories of American Politics, Elites, Interest Groups, and Average Citizens concluded, according to a Washington Times story on April 21st, that America is no longer the democratic republic that our forefathers envisioned, rather an oligarchy with a federal government that favors representation of the rich and powerful, groups and policies formed more by special interest groups than the will of the general people including the lower and middle classes. The study examined 1,800 different policies enacted between the years 1981 and 2002, but it seems more recent developments, including the 2010 Citizens United decision, and this year the McCutcheon uh, decision, which opened up a floodgate to a sea of money from anonymous donors to influence our federal elections, support the study's findings. I have nothing against the wealthy. I'd really like to join them. But <laughs> <laughs> has our government become or is it moving toward an oligarchy? And if so, what can you do as a member of Congress to help ensure what President Lincoln famously described as a government of the people, by the people, and for the people? So thank you very much for, for that question. Uh, this, is, this is certainly a problem. Uh, there are a lot of incumbency protection systems put into uh, politics these days. Uh, when I ran in the primary, there were a lot of people in the establishment who told me to not even run to don't be, don't be a part of the system. And it was very hard to compete uh, against uh, an, an entrenched incumbent. So it's a problem that I understand firsthand. It's why I've been such an advocate for campaign finance reform. It's why I believe we need a constitutional amendment to take back some of the ground that's been won uh, by the hardcore conservatives who have pursued decisions like Citizens United. It's also why I'm proud to have the endorsement of Mayor Bloomberg of New York, who only picked, he picked 10 candidates across the country who he thinks can work through the partisan gridlock and, and provide bipartisan solutions. And I think that is the kind of leadership that we need in Washington. The good thing, though, is that democracy still exists. And despite sort of running against the establishment and against the political machine, uh, I'm someone who came from a middle class background. I'm someone who's still paying his college loans every month. I don't have family money or family political connections and yet, I've been able to be here as a first-time candidate. So there are parts of our democracy that are still working very, very well. And our job as elected representatives in Congress will be to preserve those elements of democracy that have always made us great, but fight back against the elements of our society that are trying to take that power away. It's a problem in America when CEOs make 300 times the pay of average workers. It's a problem in America where the wealthiest in our society pay a lower effective tax rate than all the working families in the country. We need to, we need to bring those reforms, not just to the election system, but to the economic system, because only if we're all in this together can we make a better America for our children. Well, I have answered the question, I just say back in the early 90s, I sat 
on a conference committee that wrote an election campaign finance reform here in Massachusetts that limited the amount of money uh, that was able to go into politics and campaigns. And it served our state pretty well uh, for a long time. Uh, but obviously, with some of the uh, Supreme Court rulings and, and some of the things we see happening right now, I really do feel like we're living in the Wild West uh, as far as uh, campaign spending goes. And it's obviously a huge uh, problem. And it affects our government in a lot of different ways. I don't know if most people realize, but our tax code has been changed 4,000 times over the last 10 years. Most of those changes were made not because there was, there, it was good policy, but because somebody had a lobbyist you know, in Washington uh, who was doing uh, things for them. So I do think that the average person, the average business uh, is getting hurt uh, right now because of the uh, system that we have in place. In an ideal world, what I'd love to see is that in a congressional district, when you have a congressional campaign, the money raised uh, in a campaign should be limited to the people who live in the district. They're the stakeholders. They have the most, uh, um, you know, they have the most um, gain uh, and, and the most interest in the race. And you know, I would just say in this race, you know, Seth has raised over a million dollars from out of the district, and you know, we talk about the one percent, but he's raised more money in New York City and on Wall Street than he has in the 6th Congressional District. And I think that that's a problem, and I understand that goes on in other places, but I do think it should be the people of this district that decide and, and finance the candidates, and, and I think we'd get a better result all across the country if we did that. Uh, Mr. Mullen would like a rebuttal, 45 seconds. Thank you. Uh, I mean, first of all, with all due respect, Senator, you've been to Miami and Washington, D.C. and New York to raise money as well. Uh, but I just want to say that one of the surprises for me about this race has been the fact that we've gotten national attention. Uh, that the story of a young, pragmatic veteran running against the, step of the political establishment, running against a career politician uh, in the primary and then again in the general election, has attracted a lot of support. Uh, I'm not beholden to my donors anywhere. I think that you know that from my background, that I'm someone who can stand up and do what's right, even in the most difficult circumstances. But I am proud that so many people around the country have recognized that this is an important race and have wanted to be a part of this campaign. And if I could just offer a rebuttal to that. You know, this is our first debate here this morning, um, but our first debate was supposed to be on Wednesday at WGBH Studios. And I think, you know, when it comes to judgment, um, I just want people to know my judgment will always be to represent the people of the district. That debate uh, on Wednesday was canceled um, because um, Seth had a uh, fundraiser set up with Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who's the chairman of the Democratic National Congressional Committee. And I just think that, um, again, it boils down to judgment. Um, the race should be about informing the people of the district what our positions are and why we're the best, each one of us are the best candidate. And to uh, cancel that debate, um, I think was a mistake uh, for a political fundraiser. Um, you know, if you're going to say that money should be out of politics, you know, you should at least have had to make, make the right decision uh, to bring the campaign to the people uh, rather than um, campaigning that day with the, uh, and fundraising that day with the chairman of the National Committee. It's a really quick about that. <laughs> 15 seconds. I, I think you have six debates over the course of this campaign. Uh, if, if the presidential candidates for our country can get by with three, I think uh, six is pretty good. Thanks. But you don't schedule one and then cancel it for a hundred. <laughs> But it seems fitting on a morning uh, when Malala Yousef was named uh, very deservedly so uh, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, I think we can all agree with her how important education is. Yet in America, it seems unattainable, unattainable to so many. And uh, years ago, when people came out of college with 10,000, 15,000 maybe in debt, on average now it's 30,000, 50,000. I've worked with uh, colleagues over the years who have 100,000 in debt. What can you do to ease the pressure? I also mentioned Senator Warren has argued for uh, quite a while that the federal government should not be uh, uh, 
earning or profiting from, from uh, student loans. What can you do to help students and, and make uh, college, college attainable for all? Well, I said at the beginning, I'm the first person in my family to graduate from college. And um, I graduated in three years because it was a tremendous financial hardship for my family. Uh, so I took extra courses. I went to Salem State in the summer and ended up uh, finishing ahead. So I, under I can understand what kids are going through right now, particularly leaving college and trying to start a life with hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. Um, we have a student loan crisis, but you know what? That's a symptom of a bigger problem that we have. We have a tuition crisis. And the fact is, is that even from the time I was in college, tuitions increased by three times. And colleges, and uh, particularly private colleges and universities, need to be held accountable. At a time where we don't have really any inflation at all, tuition is going through the roof. And you have to ask yourself why. And what I do think the federal government should do is, um, is tie uh, federal aid um, to universities and colleges um, to rates of to, to cost containment. If you're a, a, a university or a college that rates are just going through the roof, I think that the federal government should hold back on federal aid. I think that that's a smart thing to do. Um, I support Elizabeth Warren's uh, bill um, in that rates should be kept as low as possible for kids just entering college. But I think all the ones who have come out uh, should have the same opportunity. I'm a real estate agent. We have the HARP program, which will really help millions of people uh, refinance their loans for their homes when they were underwater. And what I think we should do is nationally is we should have a HARP program for all those students out there who are paying high student loan rates and try to bring down those rates so that they can do the things that 20-year-olds should be doing, buying homes, getting married, and starting a life instead of uh, living under a mountain of debt. This is a problem that I also know. I know it very well because I'm still paying college loans every single month. Uh, this is absolutely a crisis in America, and it hurts our access to education. And, and the senator is right that the big problem is not just the student loan interest rates, which a lot of people in Congress are working to bring down, but the fact that college tuition has gone up 90% since 1998. And that rise in tuition is, in many respects, on the backs of students and their student loans. In fact, there was one study that showed that when the $5,000 Pell Grant program went into effect, the average cost of tuition in America went up $5,000. So tuition rise is absolutely part of the problem. Now, I'm not sure that we should, the federal government should come in and tell a private university what to do about tuition. Uh, but the federal government should at least start by making sure that our public universities are not raising tuition so dramatically as well. And so far, they have been. And the fact is, in a place like Massachusetts, where schools like UMass are so good that they will compete for students with schools like Harvard and MIT, then if we can control, help control the cost of tuition at state schools like UMass, then we can influence the market and simply buy the free market, help bring down the cost of tuition at private institutions as well. So there's an awful lot that, that needs to be done here. And I've been very proud to, uh, to already speak with Senator Elizabeth Warren about working with her on doing these things and being her counterpart in the House to make sure that we get responsible legislation passed. The next question. Our national debt, according to usdebtclock.org, as of exactly 8 o'clock last night, stood at 7 trillion and 858 billion, 963 million, 475,325 dollars. $55,977 per citizen, or $152,941 per taxpayer. Though the debt and debt ceiling are political footballs and subject of nonstop finger pointing by both parties, there's general consensus that the debt remains the biggest threat to our nation, a nation which, comparatively, is still fledgling after 238 years. The Joint Select Committee on Deficit Reduction failed in its mission to come up with a plan to reduce the annual deficit by $1.2 trillion over 10 years, resulting in the sequestration cuts of $85 billion a year split between our military and domestic programs. With the failure of the Bipartisan Committee, finger pointing that continues, and for the record, the debt ceiling has been raised uh, since 2001, seven times by President George W. Bush and seven times by President Obama. What are your ideas to reduce the debt with the least harm done to students, to small businesses, to the poor, to the sick, and to the elderly. Uh, Mr. Desai. 
I need about 40 minutes, not uh, two, to <laughs> answer that question. But what I would say is, um, it's, I think you said seven trillion, it's almost uh, 17 trillion dollars. 17 trillion, that's a huge amount of uh, money. And that is, gonna, uh, that is, you know, we're adding to it every year, we're gonna add another half a billion. It's like we have a credit card every year, and the federal government, you know, can't even meet its operating uh, costs. We have to borrow 30 cents, 20 cents on the dollar, uh, just to make basic payments. And think about all the people here who have businesses. How long would you be in business if you were operating like that, or running a household like that? A huge problem. And it's a huge problem for the next generation uh, because every kid who's born today owes $53,000 towards that debt. And the great thing about our country from the very beginning has been that one generation has always passed off to the next generation a country better than we're finding. This is the first time in American history that we're not going to do that. We're going to turn over to the next generation a country that's a real mess. And I tell you, I will work with both Democrats and Republicans in Washington. And what happens is, is that if anybody comes up with an idea or a plan, they're automatically attacked and vilified. And I do think that we may miss a huge opportunity with the Simpson Bowes because the president actually appointed them uh, to come up with a plan. There were a lot of parts of that plan that were pretty good. And then when they came out with it, he sort of, he didn't walk away, he ran away. <laughs> and so we don't really have uh, the leadership that we need uh, in Washington right now. And um, people have to get together. And the sequestration is just, you know, uh, it, it's just, you know, what you do when you can't get anything else done. It's the worst thing you could possibly do. One, per, you know, straight across the board cuts. And that ends up hurting a lot of programs uh, that uh, we want to make sure that are, are very well funded. When I served in the legislature, I voted for balanced budgets. We didn't have a um, printing machine in the basement of the state house printing out money like the federal government does. We had a balanced budgets every year. We had to prioritize spending and do, uh, and, and at the end of the day, come up with a budget that worked. And that's the primary responsibility of Congress and something that I'll work very hard uh, to do. Thank you. So, uh, the Senator, you're right, this is a big topic. But let me just offer three examples of places where I do think that Democrats and Republicans can come together to address this very, very serious crisis for America and for our children. The first is that we do need to have responsible spending cuts. And one place uh, where we need to face the reality of responsible spending cuts is the Department of Defense. I've worked in the Department of Defense. I've seen where there is waste and abuse. I've also seen where the troops aren't getting their supplies that they need, the, the tools that we need on the front lines. So we need people who can be responsible about where we make those cuts. And it's absolutely correct that the sequester is not a way to do that. Uh, we need to have leaders in Washington who are able to face the facts and do the hard work of finding out where there is waste. Uh, there are tanks being produced in the United States that the Army hasn't even ordered just because of their, uh, their business that they bring to certain congressional districts. We need people who can stand up to that bureaucracy. The second place where we can uh, lower costs and work to lower the national debt is by reforming the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I support the principles of the Affordable Care Act, expanding access to care, uh, improving health care outcomes, and lowering health care costs. But we've got to make sure that lowering health care costs is part of the equation. And that means lowering health care costs for all of you, uh, working families, small businesses. It also means lowering health care costs where there is waste and abuse at the federal government level. And the third place is with comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, I support the bipartisan effort in Congress to pursue comprehensive immigration reform. And if we did that in a responsible way, not a path, not an amnesty system, uh, but a path to citizenship for the undocumented members of our society, who are not contributing to our taxes and our revenue. Uh, one study shows that we could save $832 billion, $832 billion uh, that currently is being left on the table uh, because people around us are not paying taxes. They ought to be part of the system. They ought to be contributing to the system the way all of us are, and that will help bring down the national debt. Yeah, and I, I just say that, you know, it's funny when you look at all the reports that come out, the General Accounting Office is probably the best. They come out with a report every year. And I think most people here, would, especially owning businesses, would agree with me. There is just a tremendous amount of waste, fraud, and abuse um, all through the federal government, all through spending. The federal government spends $45 billion, $25 billion every year just to maintain vacant buildings. 
uh, just in Medicare alone, uh, it, that's a, just Medicare fraud. If you go down to Florida, that's bigger than drug um, crimes uh, as far as uh, what's going on down there. Uh, tens of billions of dollars uh, just wasted. Um, you look through every single federal agency and department and you see total dysfunction. And you know everybody always thinks that when you're cutting a budget, it's a piece of meat and you can just cut the fat right off. The fat is marbled all within the federal budget. And we have to have good management and good accountability and zero-based budgeting in order to get to, get to it all. Thank you. You both touched on this uh, next question, but I'm going to ask it anyway to give you some more time. Uh, a topic dominating headlines in late this year has been healthcare, specifically partners plan to convert Union Hospital to a primarily psychiatric treatment facility. I know you both have expressed thoughts about this plan on recent occasions, but for the benefit of the audience uh, here today, can you share those thoughts? Also, to the larger issue of healthcare reform, has the Affordable Care Act been a plus or a negative for Massachusetts, which already led the nation with its own near universal health care law? The last part of this question, what can be done? Uh, to address what the Affordable Care Act did not, soaring health care costs. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation, Massachusetts is the highest health care spending in the nation, 9728 per capita in 2009, topped only by the District of Columbia at 10349 per capita. Um, this will go to Mr. Tissay first. Well, I think the Affordable Health Care, well, first of all, um, Union Hospital, um, I was the first one who came out against that. I don't think a city with 95,000 people in a surrounding area should be left without an acute care hospital. And um, what we're seeing, what, what we're seeing in our healthcare system right now is really scary um, because it's uh, becoming a monopoly. And, and with all due respect to partners, they're a great organization. But when you have monopolies, costs go up. And that's what, and, and, and access goes down, and that's what we're seeing. But on affordable, uh, health, on whether or not the Affordable Health Care Act has been good for Massachusetts, it has been a disaster for our state. No other state has suffered more under this bill than Massachusetts. I voted for the bill here in Massachusetts, our health care bill, 77 pages long, uh, did the job, bipartisan, everybody knew what was in it, no surprises. We insured 98% of the people. Federal bill, 2,500 pages. We still don't know what's in it because it's still being rolled out. Um, very partisan, and uh, we're at the point right now where that law superseded our state law. We have more than a quarter of a million people, 400,000 people lost their insurance in the state. We have a quarter of a million people right now who are on temporary insurance. We had a website that cost $5 million to build. It worked great. Under Obamacare, $250 million spent on that website, and it's still not online, and it's still not working. And here's the thing. We need a waiver here in Massachusetts. Seth has come out against a waiver. Uh, we need a waiver because we, you know, when they passed Obamacare, they gave out all kinds of waivers. If you lived in Nancy Pelosi's district and you owned a nightclub or a bar or a restaurant, you got a waiver from Obamacare. You got consideration. Here we are, a state with 6 million people, and we couldn't get any consideration at all from the federal government. Um, our waiver requests were denied. So as a congressman, I'm going to work to try to make the Affordable Care Act work for this state by giving us the flexibility that we need um, to con rather than bring us backwards to continue to move us forward uh, as a state. Thank you. So let me just go actually in reverse order to respond to some of the things that Senator Tissé said. Uh, first of all, uh, you will find full agreement for me that the Affordable Care Act needs to be fixed. There's absolutely no question that it's not doing enough to serve small businesses and to serve working families. Uh, we've seen places where health care costs have gone up, not down, against the principles of the Act. And we need to have leaders in Washington who are willing to roll up their sleeves and fix the legislation. But the reality is, it's not going to get repealed. We're not going to start over. If we were to do that, millions of Americans who now have access to care would lose access to care. Over 10,000 people in this district who now have access to care would lose access to care. So we can't go backwards. And the other reality is that if Massachusetts gets a waiver from this system, then Texas will be next, and Mississippi and Alabama, and the entire thing will fall apart. Democrats recognize that we're all in this together. That means that we need to work hard across the country to make the Affordable Care Act work. But it doesn't mean that we're going to be able to pull it apart. It's not a political reality, and it's not a practical reality for all the Americans who are relying on that care. But let me talk about a couple of examples of things that we really can do to move forward. 
I've come out in support of repealing the medical device tax because that is hurting the small businesses, especially in this district, that are driving so much of our innovation in healthcare. That tax ought to be rolled back, especially because it hurts smaller businesses more than the bigger, biggest companies. We've got to find a way to bring more, more primary care physicians into the system. You know, Economics 101 is you push out the demand curve with so many more people eligible for primary care, but you do nothing to fix supply, costs go up. We've got to make sure there are more primary care physicians in America. Now, back to Union Hospital. Union Hospital deserves to be here. Lynn deserves to have a full-service hospital uh, because we need to increase access to care. That's something that the Affordable Care Act does. I'm not here telling you that it's perfect, but the Affordable Care Act increases access to care to Americans across the country. That's why we need to work to fix it. That's why we need to work to solve the Union Hospital crisis. Uh, to work with people like Senator uh, McGee, Representative Pryden, to make sure that this gets done. That's the spirit of leadership that I'll bring on this issue. The president's own actuary, uh, when they passed the Affordable Care Act, said that under the bill, because of some the cuts to hospitals, within a very short period of time, one out of every five hospitals would end up closing. Uh, and that's what you're seeing, the pressure, uh, as far as Union Hospital goes. Uh, the partner says plenty of money, and that shouldn't be happening. <clears throat> All of the candidates for governor at the debate the other night came out in favor of a waiver uh, for Massachusetts. And I think, you know, it's, it's um, I'm not so worried about other states. I think that this is a fundamental difference between us. Um, I think that the federal government um, has a role to play to ensure that everybody has access to health care. But our country's always been set up that the states are the laboratories of democracy. You know, here in Massachusetts, we did a good job for Massachusetts. We already had a lot of the provisions that, um, that the national bill had. So why not let each state you know, have the federal government set some targets and let each state try to meet those targets um, and, and do it on a voluntary basis rather than a one-size-fits-all um, program which is hurting people in Massachusetts. The reason why I think that healthcare is a federal issue is because I, just, I believe that access to healthcare is a civil right. That everybody in America ought to have access to decent quality healthcare. It's just why, it's the same reason uh, why civil rights and education are also federal issues. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be able to tweak the Affordable Care Act so that it meets the needs of people in different parts, parts of the country, which are different. But if you simply gave a waiver to Massachusetts, the whole act would fall apart. That's a political reality that's tough to face. And I understand that it may be more popular to say, of course, we'd like a waiver. Just like it's going to be more popular to say that in Texas or Mississippi as well. But it doesn't mean that it's the right thing for working families in America. Uh, when I say a waiver, you know, we decided what a minimum insurance policy should cover here in Massachusetts. The Democrats did that in the legislature, along with the Republican governor. The reason why we need a waiver is because the federal government imposed their own idea of what a minimum plan, a lot more costly than what we had in the state. That's why 400,000 people lost their insurance here. There was no need for that to happen uh, at all. And so when I'm saying we need a waiver, I'm not saying that, you know, to get the whole bill or repeal the whole bill, but give us some consideration. Give the state that did its job a little consideration when it comes to, uh, when it comes to healthcare. between on the one hand, you know, you first said that we should have some federal minimum standards and that's the role of the ACA. And now you're saying that the problem is that the federal uh, standards were imposed. So I just want to make sure that we're having a reasonable debate about this. I understand that we all love the Massachusetts health care plan. And it's very easy for us just to say that we should keep that. I understand. I understand. But what I think the reality is, is that this is a place where Massachusetts, rather than just doing what's right for us, ought to be a leader for the country and ought to make sure that the kind of success we've had with healthcare in Massachusetts is extended to other parts of the country in the way that Massachusetts has been a leader on so many issues in the country. One more round of this. You know what? We got a special deal with uh, our healthcare plan. We went to the federal government and said, hey, we want to put a plan together. We have a good idea. Give us some extra money and we'll do it. And that's exactly what we did. And that's what the how, that's the role of the federal government. It should be the state should be the people creating things. I don't support single payer. Vermont, if Vermont wants to do it, let them do it, and let's see how it works. And then maybe other states will want to adopt 
the best things that Vermont did or the best things that Massachusetts did. Every state is different. We had pre-existing coverage here in Massachusetts before the Affordable Care Act. You could keep your kids on insurance um, up until age 25 or 26 before the Affordable Care Act in Massachusetts. You could do all those things. This bill has hurt our state. It's driven up costs and it's really killing our job market here in Massachusetts. Uh, look, th there's no question that the ACA has driven up costs. There's no question that we need to fix it. It's about how we fix it. It's about fixing it in a way that's politically realistic, and it's about fixing it in a way that serves all Americans well. That's what I believe the role of Congress is to do. You both campaigned throughout the district extensively over the past year, and my hunch, correct me if I'm wrong, is that you agree that locally and district-wide economic development, job creation, and job opportunity remain the top concerns. But the latter will take on heightened importance for me in about eight days. Focusing specifically on the wind, what potential do you see for small, large, and industrial business growth here, and how might you help the city capitalize on that potential? as representative of the 6th District. Mr. Moulton, you go first on this one. Thank you. This is something that I talk about a lot because Lynn is a city with such incredible potential. I mean, we're only a 15-minute train ride, 25-minute drive from downtown Boston. This city has so many assets. It's really the crown jewel of the North Shore. And yet we need to do a lot to shine it up uh, because there are acres of disused industrial space. Uh, there's literally vacant land just south of here along the waterfront. Uh, there is perhaps no better place in Massachusetts to make investments that will pay off for the future than right here in Lynn. So what can we do? What we ought to do in Lynn is find a way to not just retain and bring back the old jobs that were part of the Lynn economy for many, many years, but to attract the new jobs, the innovative businesses that can come here out of the startups that start in places like Boston and Cambridge. Lynn is a great destination for businesses that are expanding. They shouldn't go to New Hampshire, they shouldn't go out west, they ought to come right here to Lynn. So what can we do to do that? Uh, my campaign has already been working uh, with a firm that helped design uh, how this was, was accomplished with the Brooklyn Navy Yards uh, in New York to act as that destination just outside of Manhattan for businesses to expand to. Uh, what can we do? We can reform the corporate tax code to make it easier for small businesses to survive here. We can build infrastructure in Lynn. Uh, Mayor Tom Costin has worked for years on bringing the blue line to Lynn. We ought to make sure that that finally happens. Improving transportation access and infrastructure to Lynn will drive the economy. We ought to do more for job training because job training doesn't just help uh, people who want to earn more a higher salary. It helps attract businesses to the district. Uh, there was a BMW plant that moved to South Carolina and had such a hard time finding workers for its plant they had to start their own facility. Well, here in the North Shore, between the North Shore Community College, Essex Technical Institute, uh, the, uh, the, the, the combination between North Shore Technical College and the Essex Aggie, uh, those are great, great engines of growth to provide partnerships between the public sector and the private sector to get that done. One of my jobs after serving in the Marines was to manage a high-speed rail project. You know, I was paid by the private sector, but I had to work with the public sector to get things done. That is the kind of leadership that we could that we need here in Lynn. Well, serving in the state senate, I had the opportunity to represent a community demographically that's pretty similar to the city of Lynn, uh, the city of Malden. And what I did is I went out, I worked very closely with the mayor, uh, the city councilors, the school committee, just all the stakeholders, the redevelopment authority. I found out what their vision was. And what I did is I acted as a, uh, you know, as a, a lobbyist for the community. And I was the biggest advocate for Malden. I helped get uh, $200 million. I passed legislation to build uh, five new schools in the city. I passed legislation that transferred this piece of state-owned land. So now that uh, they were able to build a state-of-the-art YMCA uh, building in Malden, I secured hundreds of millions of dollars in infrastructure improvements uh, on Riverwalk um, uh, to revitalize that whole section. And I guess what I'm saying is I'm not going to tell 
Lynn what they should be doing. I want Lynn to tell me, give, let me know what the strategic vision is, and I'll find a way to find federal grants and do the things that need to be done to move that vision forward. You know, being in real estate, for me, it's all location, location, location. And that's what Lynn has going for it. So close to Boston, uh, uh, waterfront. Um, this shitty city should be taking off. And um, I want to be, as the congressman for this district, be very integral in helping to do that. It's funny, Malden had a Democratic mayor um, who I worked very closely with, who actually endorsed me when I ran for re-election, got thrown out of the Democratic Convention uh, for doing it. Um, so I established a lot of great relationships and worked uh, very closely with people. But you know, it isn't the government, I just want to finish by saying, it isn't the government that creates jobs. It's the people out here in the audience. And when I'm talking to small business owners and saying, are you going to hire anybody? They all say the same thing to me. You know, either, it's either tax policy, regulatory policy, or bad laws being passed. Everybody's waiting for the next bad thing to happen. We do not have a government that's creating a good pro-business atmosphere here in the state or in the federal level. And until that happens, we're not going to have a government Okay, have three more questions. We're going to try to fit them in. We're 47 minutes in, but I do want to get to a couple questions from the audience. Uh, the next question focuses on energy. Last winter, all of us in the Northeast paid handsomely to get our homes and businesses during the polar vortex. <laughs> Predictions are uh, for a less severe winter ahead, at least in terms of cold. And home heating oil, uh, for the moment, appears unstable. Uh, but the announcement last week of a 37% electric rate by financial grid for residents, 73% for large businesses and industry, beginning in November and through April, came as an incredible shock to May. Uh, the cause, according to the utility, is a lack of natural gas capacity to the region to meet the demand for energy production. Should Massachusetts approve new pipeline projects to increase capacity? And to the bigger issue, should Northeast residents be given, uh, residents and businesses, be given some federal break, tax credit, to offset the uh, incredible cost of our generally brutal winters? Uh, Mr. Singh? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, energy costs I should put on that list. But when you hear businesses and even individuals talk about what's going on, that's one of the biggest costs here. Um, as a state senator, I supported. Um, the, I really, and as a congressional candidate, I support all of the above. We need every single energy source we can get, whether it's traditional and uh, oil and gas, or whether it's renewables, wind, solar, hydroelectric, um, to end up uh, make you know to make sure that we have the infrastructure here in the state um, to be competitive and for people to be able to survive uh, over the winters. Um, the problem that we have right now is plenty of hydroelectric up in Canada. We don't have the transmission to get it down here. We're going to have to make a huge investment uh, to be able to do that. We need those pipelines to come in. There's plenty of natural gas. There's a revolution going on in this country. We're almost energy um, independent in America right now. Uh, so we need to be able to bring that gas into uh, into uh, the New England uh, area. I think it's extremely important. As a congressman, um, I will work, and this is, I think, important, why it's important to have somebody in the majority party. Because in Congress right now, there is a fuel assistance program. We used to get about, I think, uh, $200 million for our state from that program. It's all, I think it's down right now to $125 million. Um, when issues come up, like fuel assistance in the Congress, we have nobody sitting at the table right now who can say, hey, my region, my state, this is life or death for a lot of people. Um, I will be able to do that as a member of the majority party uh, in Congress uh, to be able to advocate for the people of Massachusetts who most need that help. I hear about these concerns every day when I talk to people on the campaign trail, uh, to small business owners, to working families, to people just struggling to make ends meet. So we actually absolutely have to address this crisis. And there must, must be a comprehensive approach. Uh, I've been the manager of a big infrastructure project, so I know that it's difficult to align the interests of all the local stakeholders who are rightly concerned about uh, environmental concerns and other things with expanding capacity, whether it be pipelines or transmission, uh, but also all the people who will benefit from these infrastructure investments. You have to work between the public sector and the private sector. Uh, there's a great private sector role in energy delivery, but the public sector, the federal government, needs to support that as well to make sure that every part of the country has access to the energy resources uh, that we need. But I'd like to also take a minute to uh, respond to Senator Tissé's point about being in the majority party. The reality in Washington today is that 
a right-wing element controls the Republican Party. Maybe different than here in Massachusetts, but they are holding the government hostage. Even John Boehner couldn't stand up to them when they tried to shut down the government. So the idea that we're going to have a voice in that party is, is I think, not realistic at all. And the fact of the matter is, uh, Senator, you've been uh, a leader, an elected official in the Republican Party in Massachusetts since the 1980s. Uh, you were the leader of your Republican Party as recently as 2010. And yet in 2014, uh, when the party wanted to, when the party passed uh, legislation against equality and equal rights, uh, you weren't able to influence them to include that in there. In fact, you walked out of the conversation. So I don't see how you're going to be able to influence the far more extreme members of the party in Washington if you can't even get the party to agree on the values that we all share here in Massachusetts. Well, first of all, I'd just say I've always been my own person, and when the Republican Party on the state level put that on the platform, I thought it was important to stand up and say that's the wrong thing to do. And you know what? I've never been afraid. I've never been afraid to stand up. You know, my voting record at the state house, you can look it over very carefully. When Mitt Romney was governor, voted with him 50% of the time, voted against him 50% of the time represented a very democratic district. And the reason I, you know, the reason people elected me is they knew that when any issue came up, I would always put the people first before party. And what's happening in Washington that's so bad right now is that you have two groups of obstructionists on both sides of the aisle. They love their, they love their party more than they love their country. And both of us can sit here and say, oh, we'll be independent voices. But the fact is, I have the record. I've actually done that. I look at your I've been an independent voice all my life. I proudly served in a war that I disagreed with because I didn't want someone to go in my place. So I'm not concerned about my ability to go to Washington and to stand up to the extremists that are trying to hijack our government. But the question is, can you have influence in the party? That's the question. And the fact of the matter is that your record in Massachusetts proves that you weren't able to influence the party on some of the most important issues of the day. So if you're going to say that you're going to go to Washington and change the Republican Party, then you ought to have a track record of doing that here in Massachusetts. I'm going to go to Washington to stand up for the values that we share, to fight for equal rights, to fight for rights for women, to fight for equality across our system, to fight for equal access to education, and to fight for a fair and equitable tax code, not just for the biggest corporations in America, but for small business and working families as well. I'm going to stand up to the extremists. I'm not going to add one more vote to John Boehner and the right side of the aisle that is holding our government hostage. I'm going to stand up to them and represent the values that we share here in Massachusetts. You're just going to, you're just going to go and vote for Nancy Pelosi and the extremists on the other side of the aisle. And you know, what I'm is, I think, is after the vote, that vote takes place, the question really is, who is going to be a dependable vote for this district? You've already said during the primary, over and over and over again, I'm going to be a dependable vote for the leadership. I'm not. I'm going to do what's right for the people of the district. It's what always going to be the course of I have never said I'd be a dependable vote for the leadership. Let's not forget the Democratic leadership told me not to run. They said you shouldn't even participate in this democracy that I risked my life to defend. So I am in no way beholden to the political establishment. I'm going to do what's right for the people that I represent, just like I always fought to do what's right in some of the toughest environments on earth. That is the leadership that I will bring to Washington. I will look at whoever is running for, uh, for leader of the party. I will not necessarily vote for Nancy Pelosi. I will make a decision based on the people who are running. That is the, the leadership principle that I will always bring to everything I do as a congressman. Uh, I'm going to say this will be my final question, and I'll open it up. Uh, and this question, which I'd already prepared, was also suggested uh, by George King, retired U.S. Army, career in Vietnam. Mr. King's back there. Round of applause. And uh, I, I intend no bias whatsoever uh, before this question and saying to Mr. Moulton, we certainly all, uh, I, I think, uh, are grateful to you for your, your service in Iraq. My question is, <laughs> regarding the pre uh, president's strategy to address the threat from ISIS or ISIL, 
Is it fair to say that the effort to arm and train rebels in Iraq over a decade to police and defend their own country at a cost of billions of dollars and worse, the, uh, the toll of American lives, has proven a failure just two years after our troops' withdrawal? Uh, today, it seems the air campaign has been ineffective and ISIS is in control of many of the weapons, armor, and vehicles that America supplied or left behind. How then can repeating the same strategy to train and arm Iraqi and now Syrian rebels work this time? And should the Congress, even in a either lame duck Congress, be debating this issue today? Uh, Mr. Mulvo, I'll let you answer this one first. This is an incredibly serious issue that America faces today, and I hear about it all over the district on the campaign trail. People are concerned about ISIS, and rightfully so. ISIS has killed Americans abroad, and they've made clear their intention to kill Americans here at home. So our policy, from the president on down, ought to be to defeat ISIS. That should be our policy. But in making that declaration, we get to choose the means and the timeline to accomplish that mission. And I do not believe we should be using American ground troops on the ground right now to do this. Because if we do the Iraqis' job for them, I guarantee you we'll be back doing it again two years, three years from now, down the road. The reality is when ISIS had this dramatic expansion from Syria into western and then northern Iraq, they didn't just defeat the Iraqi army. The Iraqi army put their weapons down and walked, and walked home because they had lost faith in their government. So fundamentally, the problem in Iraq today is a political problem. And if the Iraqi army is going to do its job, we need to make sure we, pick, we fix the political system in Iraq first. This couldn't, shouldn't come as a surprise. When Ambassador Crocker and General Petraeus came back from the surge, they said, we've had great military success in the surge, but we have not made as much political progress as we need. That's why I was willing to stand up against the president and say that I'm worried about putting Americans into harm's way, not just because of the risk to Americans, but because it's not a long-term solution to the problem. I think that the president's decision to simply arm the rebels in Syria carries a lot of risks, and we need a longer-term strategy to make sure that we have a, a real plan to defeat ISIS. But I'm not just going to go to Washington and do what the president said. And Senator Tissay has said that if the president says we should put ground troops in Syria, then he'll agree to put ground troops in Syria. Congress, that's not the role of Congress. Congress has to ask the toughest questions before we put Americans into harm's way. And we need people in Congress with both the experience and the credibility to ask those toughest questions when we're dealing with crises like Iran and ISIS. We've actually never had fewer veterans in Congress in our nation's history. And we don't have a single combat veteran representing us in the House or the Senate in Massachusetts. I think we need that voice in Congress when we're facing these crises today. I think the two biggest foreign policy blunders probably in the last hundred years, first was going into Iraq, uh, but secondly was leaving Iraq uh, when we did. Uh, because obviously we left uh, way too early and everything has unraveled. And you have the president uh, basically coming out, you know, saying, oh, this is just a JV team. You don't have to pay attention uh, to them. And I think all, I think he's recognized now the seriousness of the problem. Americans are pretty war weary right now, um, but we can't stick our head in the sand and pretend this isn't happening. You know, go back to what happened um, before, prior. Uh, you know, you had Al-Qaeda declare war in the United States. They bombed the World Trade Center. They bombed the USS Cole. They bombed our embassies. Um, and then 9-11 happened. Now you have another group right now uh, that's pretty much saying, we're coming for you. And they're beheading Americans, they're, there's slaughters taking place uh, all over the place. We can't turn a blind eye to it. And I do think that, um, that at this point, I'm glad that the president has woken up. He's listening to uh, his uh, military advisors. I mean, you know, when you have Jimmy Carter coming out and saying that the president uh, is really blew it on a raft. That should really tell everybody that there's something uh, going on. Plus, his two former defense secretaries, his former secretary of state. So at this point, I think we all recognize what the threat is. I don't want to tie the president's hands. He's, a very, he's obviously very dumbish, he isn't hawkish, but if he has the intelligence and, and knows what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis, what kind of message would it have been sent if the Congress didn't approve that aid for Syrian rebels? I would give the president the benefit of the doubt. If the president comes to the Congress and says, you know what, we do need ground troops, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt because this is a huge threat. Uh, we can't pretend it's not happening. We have to, it's a threat to here in America, but the president has to articulate it.
to the American people. And there should be a full debate in the Congress. And it was very cowardly for the Congress to leave without having voted on the airstrikes. And I just think that that, um, I just think we're, we're in a very scary world right now and we can't uh, pretend that this isn't happening. I just want to make one thing clear. I will never give the president the benefit of the doubt when it comes to putting young Americans in harm's way. I will make sure that we ask all the toughest questions and limit that doubt so that there's no question it is the right decision. I would agree with that as well. I guess what I'm saying is there should be a debate that takes place. The president has an obligation to go to the American people and explain why this is a threat, why it's so important here in America. Um, and, and, you know, I, want to be, so I don't want to tie his hands. He needs all the tools in the toolbox to be able to deal with this situation. Questions from the audience. Uh, anyone? Show of hands. Back here. Uh, Hello, my name is Emily Reddick. I'm the director of the downtown and coastal district. And in terms of talking about uh, economic development, I'd like to hear a little bit about your thoughts about creative economies. It's a major, major small business industry in Massachusetts, and it's a place where enormous amounts of economic impact are happening. And so I'd like to hear, you know, Brooklyn Navy Yard is a great example of including creative economies in that plan. So I'd like to hear a little bit about your ideas about that and how you think about that in terms of economic development. Mr. Tsefers. Well, I think it obviously is an important component of economic development. I sit on the Board of Trustees at the Stone Theater. Um, I helped, uh, been working with them for a long time. That reinvigorated the entire downtown. Uh, when you talk to the mayor here, she'll tell you that the concerts that are taking place right now in the auditorium are leading to new restaurants being opened. Um, so look at what's happened up in Salem. Just a complete renaissance is taking place. Beverly, you know, things are moving forward. Um, I've always been a big supporter of Mass Cultural Council here in the state. Um, uh, you know, that distributes funds for uh, a lot of cultural events, and I uh, will do what I can to try to make sure that uh, Lynn, if, you know, uh, becomes a cultural mecca of the uh, of the North Shore. Thank you, Emily. Um, there's a lot of potential here, <laughs> and there are a few things that. Uh, that I would do as a congressman to make sure that we realize that potential. The first is I will fight against funding cuts to the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, it's a great example of an organization that we shouldn't be, be cutting. We have to cut responsible waste in Washington, D.C. We shouldn't cut funding to the NEA. I will work with local leaders to empower local arts to make sure that they have a, a solid footing and can be their own small businessmen and women in the community. And the other thing that we need is we have got to have art and music in our public schools. My sister is a public school teacher. Uh, she's incredibly smart and creative, but increasingly she's being constrained by the standardized tests. And a lot of school cuts are happening in art and music. My sister wants to educate the whole child, not just meet the requirements of a test. And I think that's very important that we preserve that in our educational system. When I was growing up, I had art and music my school, and I became very involved in, in both, especially in music. It was a very important part of my childhood, and I want to make sure that we preserve that for every child in America. Thank you, Emily. Any other questions? Uh, okay, let's go over here. Hi, uh, my name is Mitchell Brony. I'm the real estate agent Tell Williams. My question is this. And I, all the time, we spend billions of dollars overseas and other countries. And yet we look in, in our country and we see all the needs that we have, such as economic development, such as Polish tuition rising. What would you two as congressmen do to keep uh, taxes in our country where we need them versus spending billions and billions of dollars overseas? That, that question always bugs me as far as uh, why are we spending so much overseas when we need so much in this country? This is a great question because there is so much that we need to do right here at home. And I think everybody in the room uh, knows this. One of the things I'll do is I'll work to end the corporate tax inversions that send so many business profits overseas and aren't a part of our economy here at home. It's fundamentally unfair when I go to talk to small business owners around the district that their effective tax rate is higher than the chains and conglomerates that you all compete against, higher than the biggest corporations in, the, in America. And that's wrong, and we need to fix that and make sure that those profits 
uh, come back into our economy here at home. On the foreign policy front, one of the lessons that I learned uh, in the Middle East is that it's so important to have an effective State Department, that our arms of foreign policy shouldn't just be the Department of Defense. Uh, there are, there, if you go to southern Afghanistan today, uh, there is a lot of support, actually, uh, for Americans. But it's not just because we've made it possible for Afghan women to go to school or because we fought back against the Taliban that is terrorizing society. It's because of the economic investments that we made in Afghanistan in the 1950s and 60s that America made. And a lot of times it's a lot more cost effective to make those kinds of economic investments that bring returns to America as well as the countries we invest in, in addition to pursuing our foreign policy, than to simply drop bombs or send American troops. So I'm going to work in Congress to make sure that when we have a crisis overseas, we don't just look at the military options. We look at the foreign investment options as well, things that can support us here at home, but also accomplish our foreign policy goals in a much more cost-effective manner. We are, without a doubt, the uh, most generous country in the world, and you're right. You know, we're sending all this money overseas, and we're not taking care of people here in our own country, and it's a huge problem. Um, you know, we're, we're, I guess we're, you know, we've become the world's policemen. I think we have troops stationed in 145 countries around the world. Um, we have troops in Germany. We have troops in Japan. We have troops in South Korea, very wealthy countries. You know, they should be paying, if they want us there, you know, their fair share uh, of uh, our defense uh, for their countries. But I want to go back to the corporate tax right now. Corporate tax, 35%. Uh, in the United States. We have the highest corporate tax of any individual, uh, of any industrialized nation in the world. It's holding us back. The whole world has sort of gone way by us at this point. And we're at a point right now where if you live in uh, Ireland, it's 12.5%. It's 15% in Canada. You can't expect American companies to be able to compete uh, with uh, in a global economy when you have the highest corporate tax in the world. And, uh, so that, we do need corporate tax reform, uh, without a doubt. We also have um, a lot of um, money that's overseas right now because companies uh, don't want to bring their, over their profits from other countries back to the United States. Uh, repatriating that money and setting up, President Clinton had a great idea. It, you know, have sort of a tax holiday and say rather than the 35%, you know, if you bring back it, uh, for job creation, it's 10%. If you bring it back for investment in the infrastructure here in the United States, it's 20%. But what we should be doing is trying to get the $2 trillion that's sitting in, in American companies overseas back into this country to help reinvigorate our economy. And I do think that tax reform is probably one of the most important issues that the next Congress can take up. And it's something um, I've talked to Congressman Camp, who's the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, a number of times about it. Uh, he's put out a plan that could be used as a starting point, um, and it's something that both Democrats and Republicans should be able to agree on, making America more competitive again. I just want to say that this is a place where we agree, and it's absolutely a place where Democrats and Republicans can come together. A lot of Democrats are focused on the need uh, to stop these inversions and the corporate tax loopholes that let so many of the biggest corporations pay lower tax rates than all of us. But at the same time, I believe Republicans are right that we ought to lower corporate tax rates to make uh, businesses in America more competitive in the global economy. So we can definitely work together on that. <coughs> uh, thank you. We're actually 10 minutes over, so we do have to go to closings, unfortunately. I think we could uh, spend another hour here. But uh, uh, I believe uh, Mr. Tisse had the uh, opening uh, first, so we're going to go to Mr. Moulton first for the closing. Uh, two minutes, Mr. Moulton. Well, first of all, I want to thank you all for being here and joining us in this important dis debate this morning. I want to thank Senator Tissé uh, for, for, for being in this race as well and having a good debate uh, on the issues. And once again, happy Columbus Day to all of you who will be celebrating this weekend. I do believe it's time for new leadership in Washington, D.C. I believe it's time to send people who are committed to the principles that made this country strong. Uh, I do believe that the problem we have in Washington, D.C. is that there are too many career politicians who have gridlocked the government and have become beholden to the corporate and party interests that mean that we're not doing things for all of you. I've proven that I can lead in some of the toughest places on earth, and I'm going to bring that spirit of leadership to fight for you and our values 
every day in Washington, D.C. Because fundamentally, that's what we ought to expect of Congress. And there is an awful lot to be done. There's so much to be done just here in the city of Lynn, but also throughout the North Shore and the Merrimack Valley and the rest of the 6th District. Uh, to make sure that the innovative companies uh, in Bedford and Bill Rickard are thriving, to make sure that the fishermen can go back to fishing in Gloucester, and to make sure that we finally see that economic revival that we've all talked about right here in Lynn. We've got to make sure that every child has access to a good education, because that is the future of our economy, and it's the future of our country. And we've got to take care of veterans and our seniors for all the benefits that they have earned and that they deserve. Throughout all of this, I will never forget where I came from. I will never forget what it meant to be in the mud as a young Marine in Iraq. I will never forget what it meant to grow up through a public school system and what it means to still be paying my college loans every single day. And I will never forget that at the end of the day, I'm in this to be a public servant. And that means being a servant to all of you, to doing what you, to meeting your needs, to serving you in Washington, to serving this district in Washington, and to serving the United States of America that I've been so proud to serve. Thank you, as I, you know, as I travel through the district, the one thing I constantly hear from people is concern that the American dream seems to be fading away for way too many people. In fact, when I speak to groups like this, I usually will ask the question, and I'll ask it right now, you know, um, Put up your hand if you think your kids and your grandkids are going to have the same quality of life, the same job opportunities, you know, the same educational opportunities that you've had during the course of your lifetime. You know, take a look around the room. There's usually one or two hands. Oftentimes, there are no hands that go up. Our country is in a lot of trouble right now. And we, and, and we are, again, at the point, as I said earlier, with, you know, we've gone generation to generation first generation that we're about to pass on our country uh, to the next generation that's in a lot of trouble. I think that we can change things. And I don't think the problems we're having right now is because America, the American people have lost their sense of American ingenuity or their can-do spirit. The problem that we have right now is we have a government that's become too big, too dysfunctional, and too disconnected from individuals' lives. And whether, whatever area that you end up looking in right now, it's the same problem. I mean, whether it's the Secret Service, the IRS, the VA, you, you see the effects of uh, this going on right now. I want to be able to go down, work with both Democrats and Republicans, as I have done, I have a proven track record of having done that at the State House, um, to help improve people's lives. Being a legislator, there's three jobs. First, playing an active role in the, in the legislative process and in the issues of the day. Secondly, making the communities that you live in better places to live, work, and raise a family. Third, and most importantly, it's helping people individually on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And that's what I've always really worked hard to do. That's, um, I want people in Lynn to know that uh, anybody who needs help and assistance cutting through red tapes, getting through bureaucracy, will be able to come to me and I'll deliver for them. Uh, I was at the Top Seal Pier just the other day. A couple came up to me and said, hey, you've helped get my disabled son uh, into a group home 20 years ago, and I can't tell you what an effect that has had on his life. That's what public service is all about, and that's what you can depend upon from me as a partisan.